Now we come to chapter 2. And in chapter 2, we have the wedding in Cana of Galilee. And Jesus is at the marriage in Cana. This is his first miracle. We are told here that this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee. That's in verse 11. This is the first miracle that he performed. Now, this is the answer to those that teach that when the Lord Jesus was a little boy down in Egypt, that he played with the other little boys down there, and they would make clay pigeons, and then Jesus would touch them, and they'd fly away. Well, that makes a pretty good story, but there's no fact in that. And this record makes it very clear that he didn't perform miracles down there, and that's not true. This is his first miracle. And the wonder of all of this is, here is the one who is in the beginning with God. He was God. He comes out of eternity, and he's made flesh, and he's brought up for 30 years, younger in Nazareth of Galilee, and he goes over a hill to a wedding where he's been invited, evidently, very close friends of the family, and some think even relatives of the mother of Jesus. So let's look at this. And again, we are geared in with time and place. And the third day, that is the third day after these things happen, and it's the beginning now, the ministry of our Lord. And the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Now, it's the belief of a great many that the reason that she was there was she was related to the individuals that were getting married, at least one of the families. That, I think, is largely a supposition. It could well be true. But we are told also, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. Now, the Lord Jesus is also invited there. And this is the first miracle. You'll recall that the first miracle of Moses was turning water into blood. Here it's turning water into wine. And the time that's given here, the third day, there are those that gear it into the calendar of the day that was probably late February or early March in the year A.D. 27. Could well be true. And the very interesting thing is here that this is the place that's given. And In this chapter, well, we've had in the last chapter, in verse 44, we were back in Bethsaida. And now we are in Cana of Galilee. Verse 12, it'll be Capernaum. And then in verse 13, it's Jerusalem. So that we have pretty much of the geography given to us here. Now, it says that the mother of Jesus was there. She's never called Mary in John's gospel. And now we're told that Jesus and his disciples were there. And now she comes and makes a very unusual request. Notice what she says to him. She makes a very unusual statement to the Lord Jesus. It says, "...when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Now, what did she mean by that? Well, first of all, it's well to call attention. This was a very poor family. They just didn't have enough refreshments. And the question now comes up about the wine, whether it was intoxicating. And I read recently of a liberal that called Jesus a bootlegger. May I say that I wish the liberal would at least read the Scripture accurately before he makes wild statements like that. Who told him it was intoxicating? Now, it is true that in that day that wine was a staple article of diet. It's also true that drunkenness was condemned. And it's also true that wine was used in the Levitical ceremonies. It was the drink offering by the way. And no thought of drunkenness is connected with this. And these were folk who believed the Old Testament. And this is a religious 
occasion, by the way. So you can put it down that the drink was not intoxicating. Now, somebody says, can you give us something a little bit more substantial than that? Yes, I can. He turned the water into wine. I have a question myself to answer. How old was the wine? Well, he just made it. He could have made it five-year-old wine or 20-year-old wine, but he just made it. I take it that when wine's first made, it's really grape juice, and it didn't have time to ferment. So I assume that he's just made it, and it happens to be a very delicious article. Anything he'd make would be delicious, by the way. Now, will you notice, what did she mean by this, though? They have no wine. Bengal, in his commentary, he says it was a gentle hint for him and his disciples to depart. And Calvin says it was a suggestion to occupy the minds of the guests with the discourse that the mother of Jesus was saying, why don't you give them one of your famous discourses? Well, to begin with, he hadn't started yet. This is the beginning of his public ministry. And it would be just like John Calvin to suggest that, by the way. If you've ever read his institutes, and they're right up here now in my shelf, and I shudder sometimes when I look at them, because I had to read them one time in seminary, and they're profound, I admit. And I know one thing, if Calvin had been there, he'd have given them a discourse and probably put them all to sleep. But I do not think that the context here would permit either interpretation. I don't think that it was a hint for them to leave. I don't think it's a suggestion to occupy the minds of the guests. I think that very candidly what she's saying, perform a miracle. And this would be an appropriate occasion. You'll recall that when the angel Gabriel appeared to her and told her that she was the one that was to bring forth the Messiah, and she raised the question about the virgin birth, how can these things be, seeing I know not a man? And he made it very clear that the Holy Ghost shall come upon you. And he speaks of that holy thing that's conceived of you. So that all during her life, she'd been under cloud. That was a tremendous statement she made when she said to the angel, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. She yielded to that. And the moment she did, a cloud passed over her head. And there was always a question. You see, they raised questions about him. And now what she's really saying is, here is your opportunity to perform a miracle and demonstrate that I'm accurate when I said that you are virgin-born and that you are the one that I claimed that you were. But he makes it very clear here. He says to her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. He says to her, This is not the occasion. I'll clear your name, but not here. Now, when he was hanging on the cross, and the mother of Jesus was standing beneath that cross, remember, he looked down and he said to her, Woman, behold thy son. And now his hour is come. This is his hour. Because he'll die, and in three days he'll come back from the dead. And I think when they met yonder in the upper room after his resurrection and ascension, I think Mary could look around and she was there. And she could look around and say to each one of these disciples, these apostles, she says, I told you that he was the Son of God. You see, Paul says he's declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. And so she's asking him to do something that will demonstrate that it will clear her name. And he says, this is what I'm going to do. will not clear your name. Mine hour has not yet come, but that hour came. And his resurrection proves who he is, by the way. And by the way, the resurrection proves the virgin birth of Christ. We look at the virgin birth at Christmas time as an isolated 
fact, but it's connected with his resurrection, friends, because he's who he claimed to be. But now notice what happened. His mother saith unto the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Well, that's good advice. I've always wanted to preach a Mother's Day sermon on this text, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. My subject would be a mother's advice, and it'd be good advice, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. But I must confess, I never got around to it as a pastor. My, there were so many sermons I wanted to preach and never was able to do it. Now we are told, verse 6, there was set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews containing two or three firkins apiece. Now, our attention is drawn to these six water pots. They were used in ceremonial cleansing. This was a poor family, and they were evidently beaten and battered. And they'd been pushed aside, probably put in the back somewhere, so that when they had the wedding and the guests came, no one would see them. And I think our Lord must have embarrassed the family a great deed He says, bring out those water pots. Then he gives them the procedure here. He says that they're to take these water pots and they're to fill them first with water. Fill the water pots with water and they fill them to the brim. And he saith unto them, draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast and they bear it. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. Now the very interesting thing is here that we get diverted by arguing about whether it was uh, intoxicating or not. I'm confident after this message today that I will get two sets of tracks. One track will attempt to prove it was intoxicating. Another set of tracks will attempt to prove it's not intoxicating. And very candidly, that's not the issue here at all. If you think you can make something out of this, You're entirely wrong. And there's something else that's omitted here. Actually, the bride, I don't find her anywhere here. And what is the most important part of a wedding? Why, it's what the bride wears. I've had many weddings, several hundred in my ministry. And I've seen many brides come down the aisle. And I've learned in the course of time that when I come in at the beginning... Nobody's particularly interested in who the preacher is. And then the bridegroom comes in, and very candidly, there are not too many interested in who he is. The only one who smiles at him is his mother. And then the bride comes down the aisle, and everybody looks. And what did the bride wear here? We don't know. The most important part here are these empty water pots. And friend, here is something I think that is wonderful. You see, he took the water pots, he took them empty, he filled them with water, and then they ladled out the water. And I think the miracle took place when they took the water and served it to the guests. It became then wine. I think that's the way the miracle took place. Now, there's a great spiritual lesson here for you and me. You know, he uses us as water pots today. And we're just beaten, battered water pots not attractive, ought to be pushed to the side, covered up. But he wants to use us, and he wants to fill us with water. What is water? Water is the Word of God, friends. He wants to fill you with the water of the Word of God. And then, if he fills you with the water of the Word of God, then you can ladle it out. And when you ladle it out, I don't know how to explain it, but that water, when it leaves the water pots, and it gets to those for whom it's destined, it becomes the wine of joy. And joy is the work of the Holy Spirit. And we're told, be not filled with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit takes that water, performs a miracle in the life of an individual. 
And I don't know how to explain it, but I just happen to know it takes place. I have right here on my desk, right now, friends, a dozen letters that have come in here recently of people that have been saved by just hearing the Word of God over this program. Now, I don't understand it, but I know that I'm just an old water pot. And I got a little of the water of the Word on the inside of me, try to get it there, and the radio here just ladles it out. And out under it becomes the wine of joy. I don't know how to explain it. I don't know what I need to explain it. I remember years ago, I was speaking out at the Hollywood Christian Group. There was a couple there that had been saved out of a nightclub, and they said they were going to take their talent and use it for Jesus. Well, I didn't like that. I asked them afterward, What kind of a talent did you use in a nightclub that Jesus can use? Well, they stumbled around and admitted. I says, look, when you and I come to him, he doesn't get anything when he gets us, but just sinners. He gets old battered water pots. And I told him about these water pots. But I said, now he wants to fill you with the Word of God, the water, and then ladle it out. And when the Holy Spirit will ladle it out... It will become the wine of joy in your life. It'll bring new life. It'll bring a new desire. And it'll bring the joy of life in the life of a believer, if you trust him. And I met that couple because they accepted it. And they've been good friends down through the years. I met them on the street in Chicago several years ago. And I saw them coming. They saw me coming. And when I got an earshot, He said to me, he says, well, here come a couple of old beaten up water pots. Well, I want to say this, God's used them since then, but not the talent that was used in a nightclub. He filled them with the water of the word of life. And friends, this is the great message that is here. And it's a message for you and me. He wants to fill you and me with the word of God and then ladle it out. Now, in verse 12, we are told, After this he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples, and they continued there not many days. Now, I believe that this is geared into that time when his hometown would not accept him. They, you remember, got rid of him when he went into the synagogue and read from Isaiah, and they said, isn't this the carpenter's son? And they probably would have destroyed him at that time. He moved his headquarters down to Capernaum. And as far as I can tell, that continued to be his headquarters during his three years' ministry. And then you have in verse 13 now, and the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now we have another geographical point started out with Cain of Galilee, then it's Capernaum, now it's Jerusalem. And we're told that he went up, and notice how John labels this. It's the Jews' Passover. No longer the Lord's, you see. This is the Jews' Passover. Just a religious feast now that's quite meaningless, just a ritual to go through. Because the one of whom it speaks has now come, and Christ, our Passover, is offered for us. Now, our Lord went up to Jerusalem. This was now at the beginning of his public ministry. I think he'd been up there every year. All males were required to go three times a year at Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. And he went up, and this was about April the 14th, by the way. We're geared into the geography and geared into the calendar also. Now we find here that he cleanses the temple. He did twice, once at the beginning of his ministry and again at the end of his ministry. And he found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. They were selling animals, you see, the doves, and they were changing money. That is, it's quite interesting that they would not accept any kind except the temple money there, and it couldn't be any other kind offered. So they had an exchange place, and these men made money in making the exchange, by the way. When I came back from Venezuela some time ago, I 
came back with some Venezuelan money. And I wanted to get rid of it because I couldn't spend it here. And there was an exchange place in the airport. And I went up there and told them I wanted to change it for American money. And believe me, friends, I didn't get as much as when I made the trade the other way around, exchanging American money for Venezuelan money. And the believers that I turned in didn't do so well with them. That's the way they did here, you see. Somebody asked the question, why did they have this? Why did they do this? Well, the very fact that they were there is because they were making religion easy, very easy to come in and make the change there. And they would take the Roman coinage and the effigy of Caesar, or the imprint of paganism, and they changed it into Jewish coin. And they were there for the convenience of the worshipers. Actually, they'd change large coins into smaller ones. Not only did they make religion easy, they made religion cheap. And I recognize that we ought not to overemphasize money in the church and beg. But I'll tell you something worse, and that's more intolerable than that. The fact that many people treat the church and the cause of Christ so cheap that it becomes necessary to sound an alarm at times. They were selling animals, and there's a lot of traffic in those sacrificial animals, a lot of trouble to raise sheep and oxen, and somebody would have to do it for you for a price. And it's very easy for it to become a religious racket. It was an opportunity also to make religion very comfortable, very easy. And today we have a great many ways of making our churches comfortable, make everything convenient today. That's something that a great many people follow. And so we have today, I think, an anemic Christ as far as the church is concerned. They don't seem to realize just who he is. Now we find here that our Lord goes up to Jerusalem at this time, and he cleanses the temple. When he'd made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple. That means the money changers and the animals and those who sold, and the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the changers' money, and he overthrew the tables. I tell you, he was rough. No question about that. And he said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence. Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And this is something that he quotes, of course. His disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. That's in Psalm 69.9. And this is one of the six most quoted psalms, by the way, in the New Testament, Psalm 69. It's quoted 17 times in the New Testament. It's quoted in the 15th chapter at verse 25 in this gospel, in chapter 19, verse 28. Now will you notice, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. Destroy this temple. The word that he used is lucitai, which actually we get our word analysis from it. It means to untie, and he's referring here, and it does refer to the human body. Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. Then said the Jews, forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? Now, that was Herod's temple. It was still in process of being built, and it had been in the building forty-six years. And they said, you don't mean to tell us that you will be able to destroy this temple. They used the naon, which means the holy place. And what our Lord is saying here, of course, is the temple of the body. And you remember Paul put it like this, that the holy place today is not a temple made with hands, but that the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And he said that he would raise it up. Egero, he'd raise it up. Paul, in the sermon in Antioch of Pisidian, Acts 13, he used the same word four times there, by the way. 
And it actually is a word that can mean wake up. And it refers, of course, to the resurrection, refers to the resurrection of Christ, and it refers to the resurrection of believers also. And we're told in Acts 13, verse 30, but God raised him up from the dead. The idea is wake him up, the idea of waking up. And you have that in the raising up of Lazarus from the dead. It's a waking up. Lazarus, he said, come forth. And then you have him quoting also this, that he hath raised up Jesus again. Verse 33, as it is also written in the second Psalm, thou art my son this day, have I begotten thee. It refers to the resurrection of Christ, you see. And that's what our Lord said to the little daughter of Jairus, the ruler. He said to her, wake up, little lamb. And that's the picture that we have in this word. And that's what actually he means. He said he spake of the temple of the body. Now, even his disciples didn't catch that. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said that unto them. And they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. And they referred back to this after his resurrection three years later. Now we find this is his first public act when he went up to Jerusalem. And we come to something now that's intensely interesting. Actually, beginning at verse 23, we should just read right on into chapter 3, the story of Nicodemus. And we have this incident that took place in Jerusalem during the Passover. It says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast, and it's not day, but just during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. Now, a great many read that, and they say, My, isn't it wonderful that the people are believing on him? But it wasn't wonderful, friends. This was not saving faith at all. They just merely nodded an ascent when they saw the miracles that he did. Now notice what we have that follows this. But Jesus himself did not commit himself unto them. He did not believe. Actually, that is the language that is used here. He did not believe in them. They believed in him, but he didn't believe in them. In other words, actually their faith is not genuine faith, to put it very frankly. It wasn't saving faith at all. And that's always the grave danger today of those that say they believe in Jesus. Now, what do you mean when you say you believe in Jesus? Do you mean that you believe in the facts of the gospel? be pretty hard to contradict them. But those are saving facts. He died for your sins. Now, did he die for your sins? Do you trust him as your Savior from sin? Was he raised for your justification? Is he the living Savior at God's right hand today, the only hope that you have? That's important. Now, this crowd, they were interested. They saw him perform miracles. They believed. They had to. They were looking at them. But Jesus didn't believe in them. And he didn't believe that their belief was genuine, you see, because he knew all men. He knew what was in the human heart. And he needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Now, it's on the basis of that that Nicodemus comes to him. In other words, the Lord Jesus didn't commit himself under the mob there. A great company believed on it, but this man Nicodemus came to him at night, and our Lord did commit himself under this man Nicodemus. This man's faith was genuine. Now let's look at that, and let me read it together without the chapter break, because here's an instance where the chapter break is unfortunate. It says, but Jesus himself did not believe in them because he knew all men. And he needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. 
Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Now this man is set apart from the mob. Our Lord didn't trust the mob. He knew their faith was not genuine. But this man, Nicodemus, is a genuine man. Now let's get acquainted with him. Three things are said about him here. The first thing is, he was a man of the Pharisees. Now that meant that he belonged to the best group in Israel. They believed in the inspiration of the Old Testament. They believed in the coming of the Messiah. They believed in miracles. They believed in the resurrection. He was a man of the Pharisees. And his name was Nicodemus. That was his name. And he was a ruler of the Jews. I think, actually, these are the three masks that this man wore. Actually, this is a picture of modern man, if there ever was one. He was a man of the Pharisees when he met with them. He was in their midst, and he was just one of them. He more or less let down his guard. And then when he went out from the Pharisees, walked down the street, they'd see him coming, and the people would step off the sidewalk and see him coming by in his robes and his phylacteries and prayer shawl, and they'd say, My, that is the ruler, Nicodemus. He's an outstanding man. He's a ruler of the Jews. And he adopted an altogether different attitude with them. But his name was Nicodemus. And down underneath these two masks that he wore, he was just plain little old Nicky, by the way. There are many men that live like this today. There's many a man that's a businessman. He's an officer in a corporation. He goes in of a morning, and those in the office speak to him. They call him Mr., and they bow and scrape to him. And they really don't know him. They think they do, but they don't know him. And then he leaves his office and probably has several customers that morning. And they ask him about business, and oh, he says business is great. Then he goes to his club at noon for lunch. And the minute he steps inside the club, he's a different man. He's not Mr. So-and-so, the president of a corporation. He's just now old plain Bill Jones or Joe Dokes that they play golf with, and they know him, and they call him by his first name. And he adopts a different attitude, different relationship. And they ask him about business, and he tells them all business is great. And then in the evening, when the work is all done, he goes home. He opens the door to his home. He steps in takes off his coat, drops down in the chair, and he's an altogether different man. In fact, very different man. His wife comes in and looks at him as he sits there dejected. He's taken off both of the masks that he wears. He's no longer the businessman, the head of a corporation, and he's no longer one of the fellows at the club. He's just plain little old whoever he is, plain little old Nicky. And his wife comes in, And she says to him, what's the matter, Bill? Is business bad? And he says, it's rotten. (laughs) That's who he really is. Now, this man, Nicodemus, he came to the Lord Jesus with a mask on. He came to him and he said, Rabbi, we know. Who's we? Why, we Pharisees. He comes as a man of the Pharisees. He wears that mask. We know that thou art a teacher come from God for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. And he comes with a genuine compliment, by the way. He's no hypocrite. He said, we Pharisees have gotten together, and we know you're a teacher come from God. Now, I think that he came to talk about the kingdom of God. The Pharisees wanted to establish it and throw off the yoke of Rome, and they had no way of doing it. But here comes this one who's so popular multitudes are following him now. They want to get with him and hitch their little wagon to his star. And he probably has come from up in the country, up in Galilee, and he doesn't know how to deal with these politicians of Rome. They do. And so he comes in a condescending manner, and he says, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. 
He had to recognize the miracles. They didn't doubt the miracles of our Lord, friends, in that day. You've got to be a professor in a seminary today, 2,000 years removed and several thousand miles removed from where it took place. And if you'd been back there, you wouldn't have denied the miracles. Now will you notice, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, that's the reason I think he came to talk about the kingdom of God. I see no reason why our Lord would have referred to it. In other words, our Lord almost abruptly interrupts him and breaks in. And he says to him, the thing is, you can't even see the kingdom of God except you've been born again. Now, here's a man religious to his fingertips, and he's a Pharisee. And yet our Lord said to him, You won't even be able to see the kingdom of God except you be born again. And how important it would be for him to be born again. Now Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And our Lord said to him, To be born again, anothen, to be born from above. And this man Nicodemus can't think of anything but a physical birth. And he immediately, you see, drops the mask that he's been wearing, a man of the Pharisees condescending to Jesus, and he becomes a ruler of the Jews. He says, how can a man be born when he's old? Why, he said, don't you know, as a ruler of the Jews, I would know all about this. And then he points out how ridiculous it is. Can he enter the second time in his mother's womb and be born? Well, the interesting thing is our Lord wasn't talking about a physical birth at all. But Nicodemus, you see, couldn't think of a spiritual birth at all. This man had no spiritual capacity to take it in. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. What does it mean to be born of water and of the Spirit? Now, there are those that believe that be born of water is a reference to baptism. But may I say that this would be a strange expression if it did refer to that. And there are those, there have been several very fine Christian doctors that say the physical birth is a birth in water, that is, the child in the womb. And be that as it may, I don't think that is this at all. And he speaks of the natural birth and the spiritual birth. But he's not talking of that. He's talking about how a man can be born from above or again, to be born of water and of the Spirit. We've already made it clear, at least I hope we have, back in chapter 2, water there was the Word of God. And we'll find later on in this very book, that he prays, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. The cleansing, sanctifying power of the word. And the Lord Jesus said, you're clean through the word that I've spoken unto you. And the word of God is likened unto water again and again. And we believe that a person to be born again must be born again by the use of the Scripture, and it's the Holy Spirit taking the Scripture and using it. We believe very definitely that no one could be born again without the use of the Word of God. That's the reason it's so important today, to be born of water and of the Spirit. And the Spirit, of course, uses the Word of God. You have three outstanding conversions that are in the book of Acts. They're given to us, I think, primarily as illustrations. You have the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch, conversion of Cornelius, and the conversion of Paul. These belong to the three families of Noah, the son of Shem, the son of Ham, the son of Japheth. These three, in each case, you have the Word of God used, and the Word of God is used by the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God using the Word of God through the man of God. And that seems to be God's method today. And our Lord, I'm confident, meant that you must be born of water and of the Spirit. And it's the Spirit of God using the Word of God. And he says he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. 
Now he says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. This old nature that you and I have, God doesn't intend to change it. fact of the matter is, it can't be changed. It's just impossible. The Word of God has so much to say about this old nature that you and I have, that the flesh is absolutely enmity against God. Paul says in Romans 8, 7, "...because the carnal mind is enmity against God." It's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. This old nature that you and I have, God hasn't any program to try to retrieve it or to improve it or to develop it or to save it. That old nature is to go down in the grave with us. And if the Lord comes before we go to the grave, that we are to be changed. And that means to get rid of that old nature. It can never be made obedient unto God. No way in the world. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That's an axiom. And God does not intend to save their flesh at all. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And that's the reason that the spiritual birth is necessary, that you and I must be given a new nature, is because this old nature is gone, friends. It's absolutely a nature that cannot be retrieved at all. Now the Lord Jesus says to this man, Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. This man, you see, put up this mask, and he's losing it now. The mask of the ruler of the Jews is falling off. And the Lord Jesus said to him, Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth. Thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that's born of the Spirit. Now, you can't tell where the wind comes from. You can't tell where it's going. The air currents and the winds are something that man still doesn't know very much about. The wind bloweth where it wills. You can't change it. They're trying today to seed down these hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean area. So far, they haven't done very much with it. They can't tame the wind. The wind bloweth where it listeth. Thou hearest the sound thereof, canst not tell whence it cometh, whither it goeth. So is every one that's born of the Spirit. Now, though you can't control the wind, you can sure tell when it's blowing You and I can be standing out on the street, and you can say to me, well, the wind is blowing. I say, how do you know? You say, look at that tree up there. See how the leaves are blowing? And notice how the tree is bending over? You can tell when the wind is blowing. Now, friends, the one's born of the Spirit. I don't know how to explain to you the spiritual birth. Now, I know there are a lot of books out on that today to explain it. The difference between me and the fellows that write those books is just simply this. They don't seem to know they don't know. At least they're willing to admit, I don't know. The wind bloweth where it listed. I don't quite understand it. But that's the way the ones that are born of the Spirit. I can't tell you exactly how the Spirit of God operates, but I do know this. I can sure tell when He is moving in the lives and hearts of His people. And that's exactly what our Lord is saying here. Now, our Lord's got rid of the two masks. The man that stands before us is no longer the man of the Pharisees, and he's no longer the ruler of the Jews. And who is he? Listen to him. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Now he stands there as just plain little old Nicky. (laughs) He now is asking the question, How can these things be? Now our Lord's going to talk to him very plainly. And by the way, you and I can put up our masks before each other. And there's so many people today that use them. They are with a certain crowd. They act a certain way. But the mask today, friends, hides just how we really are. Now, when you come to the Lord Jesus, you have to take off all your masks. You can't use them there. You have to be the real you. You have to come just as you are then the Lord will deal with you that way. And that's the way he dealt now with Nicodemus. Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou master 
of Israel, and knowest not these things. And that's just a gentle satire that the Lord is using here. He says to this man, Well, I thought you were a ruler in Israel, and you were acting as if I was telling you something that couldn't be true, because if it was true, you'd know about it. And now our Lord says, Don't you know these things, Nicodemus? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know and testify that we've seen, and you receive not our witness. Now, he says, you haven't received our witness, even as we've spoken to you. Now, if I've told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven." There is a tremendous movement here in the Gospel of John. I called attention in the introduction where our Lord in John 16:28 says, I have come forth from the Father and am come into the world. Again, I leave the world and I go to the Father. And now he says here, No man hath ascended up to heaven. And that is my answer to those today who feel like that Elijah and that Enoch went to heaven when they were translated. I don't think so, because up to this point, the Lord Jesus said, No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. In other words, he says that he is the only one that can speak about heaven, because he's the only one that hath ascended up to heaven. Now, since then, there have been a host of folk that have gone to heaven. But in the Old Testament, when a saint of God died, one of God's own, he went to a place It's called Abraham's bosom. Now, the Lord called it that. It's called paradise. Paul called it that. But it was the place where they went as far as the Old Testament is concerned. It was not till after Christ died ascended to heaven, led captivity captive, that he took those that were there into God's presence. And since then, for the child of God, it's always been absent from the body, present with the Lord. What a picture that we have here, and what a glorious picture it is. So that what he's saying here, no man hath ascended to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven." Now listen to this. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, when Moses put that serpent up because of the sin of the people, all they had to do was to look to it. Now, he says, Moses lifted up the serpent, and he's going to be lifted up. Now, that serpent represented the sin of the people. And Christ was made sin for us on the cross. We bore our sin there. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now notice, our Lord comes back and says that to Nicodemus in probably the most familiar verse that we have in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, there are two things that we need to note here. One is that we are told, ye must be born again. But in this section, we're told the Son of Man must be lifted up. They're related. It takes the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, He must be lifted up. And since he's been lifted up and he bore our penalty, then now the Spirit of God can regenerate us and we must be born again. That's the only way God can receive us. Now, the motivation is that God so loved the world. God never saved the world by love. That's a big mistake today. It doesn't say God so loved the world, he saved the world because the love of God could never save a sinner. God does not save by love, friends. God saves by grace. By grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, 
not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, how does God save? By grace. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever, and you can write your name in there, I can write mine, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And you have here with the word believe the little preposition in. It means to believe in Christ, means to trust him as the one who bore the penalty for your sins and that he died in your room and in your stale. Now notice he goes on, for God sent not his Son into the world to condemn or to judge the world, but that the world through him might be saved. If you'll notice, when he came the first time, he was not a judge. He made it very clear to this man who wanted him to sit in judgment between himself and his brother. He said, who made me a judge over you? He didn't come as the judge the first time. He came as the Savior. He comes the next time as the judge. And he says here that God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But if you don't, you're already condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed on the name. What is that name? It's the name of Jesus. You'll call his name Jesus because he's the Savior of the world. Now, you see, he's talking to Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a Pharisee, and the Pharisees believed that the Messiah, when he came, he would judge. And in the Old Testament, presented two aspects of the coming of the Messiah. He was coming as a Savior, coming to die, come to pay a penalty. And then he was coming as the judge, and the word here means that. And they had reason to believe that the Messiah would be a judge when he came, because we are told in Psalm 2 and verse 6, he shall judge them with a rod of iron. Daniel speaks of him as the judge of the whole earth. And in Psalm 45, why, we're told there he'll judge the world in righteousness. And in Isaiah 11, again, we're told that, that he's the righteous judge. And then again in Isaiah 42. And even the prophets mention this. Well, friends, the Lord Jesus is making it very clear now to Nicodemus that God sent not his Son into the world this time to judge the world, but that the world through him might be saved. It's God's redemptive purpose embracing the entire world. He's not to condemn, not to judge the world. Now, in Christ, there's no condemnation. But those that are not in Christ are already condemned. There are a great many that feel like the world's on trial today. It's not. The world is lost. You and I live in a lost world. And we not wait until the final judgment day to see you're already lost. That position is something like this. You ask a man in prison to accept a pardon, whether he will or not. And that's the gospel today. It's not telling man you're on trial. It tells man that he's lost. He's already in prison waiting for execution, but there's a pardon offered to him. And the point is, will you accept the pardon? My, how wonderfully clear that is, by the way. And it makes clear what the gospel really is. It's to save those that are already lost. Now we have here that this is the condemnation or the judgment, if you please. This is the judgment that light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. This is the judgment, you see, of the world. The day that the world crucified Christ, that's the day that the world made a decision that it must be judged of God, by the way. This is the condemnation or the judgment that lights come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Their deeds were evil. They were habitually evil. And men love the darkness. Naturally, men do not want the light at all. And only those that have come to Christ and only those that have turned to him. And you'll notice that in this verse, 
our Lord approaches so many things from the negative viewpoint. We hear today the power of positive thinking. Well, believe me, friends, there's a lot of power in negative thinking also and negative speaking. Listen to him in other places. I came not to call the righteous. Oh, the power that's in that. The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. And God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world. You see, the negative that he uses here. And he says, For every one that doeth evil hateth the light. Verse 20. Then, in other words, whoever practices habitually what is wrong hates the light. And then light and truth are the same. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. And error and darkness are always in contrast to light and truth. Now we see the Lord Jesus going into Judea, and there he tarried with them. And then we see him moving out of that area. And in verse 24, we are told John was not yet cast into prison. In other words, after the Lord's temptation, John was cast into prison. The other Gospels tell us that. Now we read in verse 22, After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. And John also was baptizing in Ainon near to Salem, because there was much water there, And they came and were baptized, for John was not yet cast into prison. You see, at this time, John was still able to preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, we're told there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee, but yon Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. That is a very interesting statement. The disciples of John, I would assume, are jealous. In other words, do not mention the name of Jesus. It would be best if you hadn't. And then the second thing, you should not have borne witness to him to begin with. And all are going to him. Well, that's hyperbole. You're going to lose all your followers. That's what they're saying to him. Well, this man makes it very clear. Not a jealous bone in the body of John. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him of heaven. The tremendous force of this, friends, you can't escape it. And again and again it will come out. You will find, for instance, the Lord Jesus saying again, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. That's John 6, 65. How tremendous these statements are. Then we find in verse 30 here, He must increase, but I must decrease. John the Baptist ministry now comes to an end. And I want to drop on down to verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth in him. That is the settled indignation of God. John the Baptist preached the gospel, as you can see. This was the message that he gave, that men are lost without Christ. How tremendous this is. 